The Threshold of the Terrestrial Planet, The Noosphere, by Father Teilhard de Chardin. When compared to all the living vertices, the human phylum is not like any other. But because the specific orthogenesis of the primates urging them towards increasing cerebralization coincides with the axial orthogenesis of organized matter urging all living things towards a higher consciousness, man, appearing at the heart of the primates, flourishes on the leading shoot of zoological evolution. It was with this observation that we rounded off our remarks on the state of the Pliocene world. It is easy to see what privileged value that unique situation will confer upon the transit to reflection. The biological change of state terminating in the awakening of thought does not represent merely a critical point that the individual or even the species must pass through. Vaster than that, it affects life itself in its organic totality and consequently it marks a transformation affecting the state of the entire planet. Such is the evidence, born of all the other testimony we have gradually assembled and added together in the course of our inquiry, which imposes itself irresistibly on both our logic and observation. We have been following the successive stages of the same grand progression from the fluid contours of the early earth, Beneath the pulsations of geochemistry, of geotectonics, and geobiology, we have detected one and the same fundamental process, always recognizable, the one which was even given material form in the first cells and was continued in the construction of nervous systems. We saw geogenesis promoted to biogenesis, which turned out, in the end, to be nothing else than psychogenesis. With and within the crisis of reflection, the next term in the series manifests itself. Psychogenesis has led to man. Now it effaces itself, relived and absorbed by another and higher function, or relieved. The engendering and subsequent development of the mind, in one word, neogenesis, when for the first time in a living creature instinct perceived itself in its own mirror, the whole world took a pace forward. As regards the choices and responsibilities of our activity, the consequences of this discovery are enormous. As regards our understanding of the earth, they are decisive. Geologists have for long agreed in admitting the zonal composition of our planet. We have already spoken of the barosphere, central and metallic, surrounded by the rocky lithosphere that in turn is surrounded by the fluid layers of the hydrosphere and atmosphere. Since Seuss, science has rightly become accustomed to add another to these four concentric layers, the living membrane composed of the fauna and flora of the globe, the biosphere. So often mentioned in these pages, an envelope as indefinitely universal as the other spheres and even more definitely individualized than them. For instead of representing a more or less vague grouping, it forms a single piece of the very tissue of the genetic relations which delineate the tree of life. The recognition and isolation of a new era in evolution, the ear of neogenesis, obliges us to distinguish correlatively a support proportionate to the operation, that is to say, yet another membrane in the majestic assembly of telluric layers. A glow ripples outward from the first spark of conscious reflection. The point of ignition grows larger. The fire spreads in ever-widening circles till finally the whole planet is covered with incandescence. Only one interpretation, only one name, can be found worthy of this grand phenomenon. Much more coherent and just as extensive as any preceding layer, it is really a new layer, the thinking layer, which since its germination at the end of the tertiary period has spread over and above the world of plants and animals. In other words, outside and above the biosphere, there is the nuosphere. With that, it bursts upon us how utterly warped is every classification of the living world, or indirectly every construction of the physical one, in which man only figures logically as a genus or a new family. This is an error of perspective which deforms and uncrowns the whole phenomena of the universe. 
To give man his true place in nature, it is not enough to find one more pigeonhole in the edifice of the systematization or even an additional order or branch. With harmonization, in spite of the insignificance of the anatomical leap, we have beginning of a new age. The earth gets a new skin. Better still, it finds its soul. Therefore, given its place in reality, in proper dimensions, the historical threshold of reflection is much more important than any zoological gap, whether it be the one marking the origin of the tetrapods or even that of the metazoa. Among all the stages successively crossed by evolution, the birth of thought comes directly after and is the only thing comparable in order of importance to the condensation of the terrestrial chemism or the advent of life itself. The paradox of man resolves itself by passing beyond measure. Despite the relief and harmony it brings to things, this perspective is at first sight disconcerting, running counter as it does to the illusion and habits which incline us to measure events by their material face. It also seems to us extravagant because steeped as we are in what is human like a fish in the sea, we have difficulty in emerging from it in our minds so as to appreciate its specificness and breadth. But let us look round us a little more carefully. This sudden deluge of cerebralization, this biological invasion of a new animal type which gradually eliminates or subjects all forms of life that are not human, this irresistible tide of fields and factories, this immense and growing edifice of matter and ideas, all these signs that we look at for days on end to proclaim that there has been a change on the earth and a change of planetary magnitude. There can indeed be no doubt that to an imaginary geologist coming one day far in the future to inspect our fossilized globe, the most astounding of the revolutions undergone by the earth would be that which took place at the beginning of what has so rightly been called the Psychozoic Era. And even today, to a Martian capable of analyzing sidereal radiation psychically, no less than physically, the first characteristic of our planet would be not the blue of the seas or the green of the forests, but the phosphorescence of thought. The greatest revelation open to science today is to perceive that everything precious, active, and progressive originally contained in that cosmic fragment from which our world emerged is now concentrated in a crowning newosphere. And what is so supremely instructive about the origins of this newosphere, if we know how to look, is to see how gradually, by dint of being universally and lengthily prepared, the enormous event of its birth took place. Two, the original forms. Man came silently into the world. For a century or so, the scientific problem of the origin of man has been under discussion, and a swelling team of research workers has been digging feverishly into the past to discover the initial point of harmonization, and yet I cannot find a more excessive formula than this to sum up all our prehistoric knowledge. The more we find of fossil human remains and the better we understand their anatomic features and their succession in geological time, the more evident it becomes by an unceasing convergence of all signs and proofs that the human species, however unique the ontological position that reflection gave it, did not, at the moment of its advent, make any sweeping change in nature. Whether we consider the species in its environment, in the morphology of its stem, or in the global structure of its group, we see it emerge phyletically, exactly like any other species. Firstly, in its environment. As we know from paleontology, an animal form never comes singly. It is sketched out in the heart of a vertical of neighboring forms among which it takes shape, so to speak, gropingly. So it is with man. Regarded zoologically, man is today an almost isolated figure in nature. In his cradle, he was less isolated. Nowadays, there is no more room for doubt. Over a well-defined but immense area extending from South Africa to southern China and Malaya, amongst the rocks and the forests at the end of the tertiary period, the anthropoids were far more numerous than they are today. Besides the gorilla, chimpanzee, and orangutan, now thrown back into their last strongholds like the Australian bushmen and the negrillos of our day, 
there was a whole population of other big primates, some of whom the African Australopithecus, for instance, seem to have been far more hominid than any alive today. Secondly, in the morphology of its stem, with the multiplication of sister forms, what indicates to the naturalist the origin of a living stem is a certain convergence of the axis of that stem with that of its neighbors. In the proximity of a knot, the leaves grow closer together. Not only is a species at the birth found bunched with others, but like them is portrayed much more clearly than in adult life its zoological parentage. The farther we follow an animal line back to the past, the more numerous and the more palpable are its primitive features. Here, too, man, on the whole, keeps strictly to the habitual phyletic mechanism. All we need is to try to arrange in a descending series Pithecanthropus and Synanthropus after the Neanderthaloids <laughs> below present day man. Paleontology does not often succeed in tracing so satisfying an alignment. Thirdly, in the structure of its group. However well defined the characters of a phylum may be, it is never found to be altogether simple like a pure radiation. On the contrary, as far as we can follow it into the depths of its past, it manifests an internal tendency to cleavage and dispersion. Newly born or even while being born, the species breaks up into varieties or subspecies. This is known to all naturalists. Keeping it in mind, let us take another look at man, man whose prehistory, even the most ancient, proves his congenital aptitude for ramification. Is it possible to deny that in the fan of the anthropoids he isolated himself? In this subject to the laws of all animate the matter, as a fan of his own? I was not exaggerating in the least. The more deeply science plumbs the past of our humanity, the more clearly does it see that humanity as a species conforms to the rhythm and the rules that marked each new offshoot on the tree of life before the advent of mankind. Thus, we are logically obliged to pursue the subject to its conclusion. Since man as a species is at birth so similar to the other phyla, let us stop being surprised if, as with all living groups, the fragile secrets of his earliest origins give our science the slip, and let us henceforward forbear to force and falsify this natural condition with clumsy questionings. Man came silently into the world. As a matter of fact, he trod so softly that when we first catch sight of him as revealed by those indestructible stone instruments, we find him sprawling all over the old world, from the Cape of Good Hope to Peking. Without doubt, he already speaks and lives in groups. He already makes fire. After all, this is surely what we ought to expect. As we know, each time a new living form rises up before us out of the depths of history, it is always complete and already legion. Thus, in the eyes of science, which at long range can only see things in bulk, the first man is and can only be a crowd and his infancy is made up of thousands and thousands of years. If we have understood the limits of enlargement imposed by nature on the instrument which helps us to study the landscape of the past, we shall be prepared to forego the satisfaction of this futile curiosity. No photograph could record upon the human phylum this passage to reflection which so naturally intrigues us. For the simple reason that the phenomenon took place inside that which is always lacking in a reconstructed phylum, the peduncle of its original forms. But if the tangible forms of this peduncle escape us, can we not at any rate guess indirectly at its complexity and initial structure? On these points, paleoanthropology has not yet made up its mind. We could, however, try to form an opinion. Note, some idea of how the transit to man was affected zoologically is perhaps suggested by the case of Australopithecus mentioned above. In this South African family of Pliocene anthropomorphs, evidently a group in a state of active mutation, in which the whole series of hominid characters overlay a basis still clearly simian, we can see an image, perhaps, or call it a faint echo of what was taking place at about the same period, even not far from there, in another anthropoid group, in this case, culminating in genuine hominization. 
A number of anthropologists, and those not the least eminent, think the peduncle of our race must have been composed of several distinct but related bundles, just as on the plane of human intellect, once a certain degree of preparation and tension had been reached, the same idea may come to birth at several points simultaneously, so in the same way, man, according to these authorities, must have started simultaneously in several regions on the anthropoid layer of the Pliocene era, thereby following the general mechanism of all life. This is not, properly speaking, polyphyletism, because the different points of germination are located on the same zoological stem, but it is an extensive mutation of the whole stem itself. The idea involves hologenesis, and therefore polycentricity, what we get is this whole series of points of hominization scattered along a subtropical zone on the Earth, and hence several human stems becoming genetically merged somewhere beneath the threshold of reflection. Not a focus, but a front of evolution. Though not disputing the value of, and the scientific probabilities of this perspective, I feel myself personally attracted to a slightly different hypothesis. I have already stressed several times that curious peculiarity shown by zoological branches of bearing fixed on them. Like essential characters, certain traits whose origin is plainly peculiar and accidental, such as the tritubercular teeth and seven cervical vertebrae of the higher mammals, the four-footedness of the walking vertebrates, the rotatory power in one particular direction of organic substances. Precisely because these traits are secondary and accidental, their universal occurrence in groups, sometimes vast, can only be properly explained by assuming that these groups, to derive from a highly particularized and therefore extremely localized vertical, we would thus perhaps find no more than a single radiation in a vertical to support originally a layer or even a branch or even the whole of life. Or if some convergence has played a part, it can only have been amongst closely related fibers. In the light of these considerations, and particularly when dealing with a group as homogeneous, as specialized as the one under discussion, I feel inclined to minimize the effects of parallelism in the initial formation of the human branch. On the vertical of the higher primates, this branch did not, in my opinion, glean its fibers here and there, one by one, from the whole range offered. But... Even more closely than any other species, this branch, I am convinced, represents the thickening and successful development of one solitary stem among all. This stem being, moreover, the most central of the collection because the most vital and, except for the brain, the least specialized. If that is right, all human lines join up genetically, but at the bottom, at the very point of reflection. Note, which amounts to saying that if the science of man can say nothing directly for or against monogenism, a single initial couple, it can, on the other hand, come out decisively, it seems, in favor of monophyletism, a single phylum. And now, if we do assume the strictly unique existence of such a peduncle at the origin of man, what more, still keeping to the plane of pure phenomena, can we say about its length, and probable thickness, should we, like Osborne, locate its separation very low down in the Eocene or Oligocene period in a ramification of pre-anthropoid forms? Or should we, like W.K. Gregory, regard it as a branching off from the anthropoid vertical as late as the Pliocene age? Another question, always on the same subject and still maintaining a strictly phenomenal attitude, what minimum diameter should we ascribe as biologically possible to this stem, whether it is deep or not, if we consider it at its initial point of harmonization. For it to be able to mutate, resist, and live, with what is the minimum number of individuals in, in order of size that must have undergone simultaneously the metamorphosis of reflection? However, monophyletic one supposes it to be, surely a species is always sketched out like a diffuse current in a river, by mass effects? Or, on the contrary, should we rather view it as propagating itself like crystallization beginning with a few parts by effective unities? In our minds, the two symbols, each partly true perhaps, still conflict and have their respective advantages and attractions. We must have the patience to wait until their synthesis is established. Let us wait. 
And to encourage our patients, let us recall the two following points. The first is that on every hypothesis, however solitary his advent, man emerged from a general groping of the world. He was born a direct lineal descendant from a total effort of life, so that the species has an axial value and a preeminent dignity. At bottom, to satisfy our intelligence and the requirements of our conduct, we have no need to know more than this. The second point is that, fascinating as the problem of our origin is, its solution, even in detail, would not solve the problem of man. We have every reason to regard the discovery of fossil men as one of the most illuminating and critical lines of modern research. We must not, however, on that account, entertain any illusions concerning the limits in all its domains of that form of analysis that we call embryogenesis. If in its structure the embryo of each thing is fragile, fleeting, and hence in the past practically ungraspable, how much more is it ambiguous and undecipherable in its lineaments? It is not in their germinal state that beings manifest themselves, but in their fluorescence. Taken at the source, the greatest rivers are no more than narrow streams. To grasp the truly cosmic scale of the phenomenon of man, we had to follow its roots through life, back to when the earth first folded in on itself. But if we want to understand the specific nature of man and divine his secret, we have no other method than to observe what reflection has already provided and what it announces ahead. This is from Terre de Chardin, The Phenomenon of Man, His Masterwork, and a seminal book in phenomenology and um, process theology, really early process theology. He was a Jesuit priest and uh, not popular by the Vatican, but still touted as a prophet of humanity for his visions of the future of the human race. Um, we'll continue more with the deployment of the neurosphere next time. I'm partly doing this not to overwhelm us with language in a field that none of us probably study, but because I encourage you to read his work and especially look at his visions of how humans would develop. He is widely accredited for predicting the Internet and this whole satellite network of consciousness that we are creating at this time. Enjoy, and have a good day. Please follow on Spotify and give me a review on Apple Podcasts. Cheers.